Welcome to the Metaphoricist Magazine podcast, your home for beautifully made speculative fiction. The magazine is edited by B. Morris Allen, and I'm your host, Matt Gomez. This week's story, narrated by the author, is Visions for the Independent City of New York by Sidney Mays. Sidney Mays is a middle school librarian from Portland, Maine, with a passion for anything magical. When not writing, she enjoys giving tarot card readings, walking outdoors with a good audiobook, or playing board games with her husband and friends. Find her online at sydneymays.com. That's C-I-D-N-E-Y-M-A-Y-E-S.com. On Twitter at Sydney Mays, or on Instagram at sydney.mays. Let's jump in. Addie Bell was six years old when she first held colored drawing pencils between her uncoordinated fingers and made marks on a crumbling map of the old flooded tunnels beneath the city. It was a typical pastime for a child of her age, but looked different depending on what district of the independent city of New York the child found themselves living in. If Addie had resided in the Cloud District, she would have colored with a stylus on a tablet swiping in a palette of pixels to drop red into the waiting outline of an apple on her device. Her street would have been clean, her clothes pristine, and the top of her house would have reached like a golden chapel into the sky. If she had lived in the mids, Addie would have sat in a clump of other children her age, sharing supplies and fighting over who would get to use their orange pencil to color in the sweet fruit on their alphabet worksheet. Her father would have had a blue-collar job and kept things in the cloud district running smoothly. He would have been compensated well for his services. Instead, Addie Bell was one of the few children in the deep, the level of the city that sat closest to the polluted water to own such a nicety as colored pencils, and thought herself very lucky to have such a treasure. Addie's father, Charlie, was a weathered man with gnarled, arthritic hands who walked the dank streets, collecting all manner of items. An accident on an oil rig had robbed him of good posture, unable to perform the necessary heavy lifting out at sea. So he walked the streets and shores looking for things to sell. Objects dropped by those who lived above or washed up on the street banks with the tide. Items that would fetch a good price with the junk man were quickly sold, but occasionally he would bring home a gift to his daughter. It was just the two of them who lived in a city-appointed wooden shack that could not keep out the damp. When he saw the pencils on a grimy street corner, fallen through a grate in the scaffolding above that held the rest of the city aloft, he pocketed them. His daughter's rise to fame and subsequent tragic fall was not something he anticipated when he handed her the mildewed, tattered box of half-used drawing pencils. Addie was fascinated with her new colors. Boxes, scraps of paper, and even the walls of their shack became her canvas filled with faintly drawn shapes and lines. She knew that it would be very hard for her father to find more of the magic pencils, so she used them lightly, delicately, leaving whispers of luminous color one might miss unless they looked carefully. The day after her father had given her the pencils, Addie went with her neighbor, Mrs. Martinez, while her father went off to pick through Flotsam. Together, Addie and Mrs. Martinez walked for half an hour up the winding, unsteady steps to the lower mids to take their usual spot. While Mrs. Martinez, a short woman with ink-black hair and a kind face, thrust her wooden cup into the path of passers-by, pleading for alms, Addie entertained herself by drawing on the cracked concrete, relishing the soft scratch of her pencil against the pebbly surface. Mrs. Martinez's benefactors were quick to give Addie a bit of their change, too amused and maybe a little wistful that she knew nothing yet of life's hardships and cruelty. Addie accepted the coins shyly, placing them with a muted clink into her dress pocket. She dutifully gave the coins to her father that night. She didn't need them. She had her magic pencils. Besides, her father used the money to buy them something good to eat, slices of not-too-moldy bread and pale cheese, which they toasted over their stove. Addie drew a picture of herself and her father, eating their cheesy toast together, which he accepted with wet eyes and pinned to the wall of their shack. Everything changed the day a city official, 
clothed in white and carrying a tablet that glowed blue, meandered down the street. He stopped occasionally, making notes on his screen and commiserating with his assistant about the poor conditions of the lower mids. Addie watched out of the corner of her eye and noted that the hem of his pristine robe was smeared with dirt. He mumbled to his assistant something about real change this term. He stopped in front of Addie's spot and cocked his head, staring at her with the curiosity of a cat watching a fish floundering in the shallows. Addie kept her eyes fixed on her work. She drew faces of people on the street with surety, tiny birds who rummaged through the trash bin with realistic detail, and the market streets of the mids with captivating perspective. Her drawings had a strange, bright quality due to her odd color choices. Addie felt the hair on the back of her neck prickle as the man watched her. Finally, he cleared his throat and asked, Child, what is your name? Addie Bell, she replied, not looking up from her work. People around them grew quiet. Mrs. Martinez clutched her wooden cup and took a few steps closer to her charge. The city official, more astute than his peers who had never left their burrow in the skies, sensed the uneasiness at his presence. The citizens were wary of his pointed interaction. Well, Addie Bell, might I commission you to draw something for me? He held a silver coin between two fingers. It caught the light, and the small crowd grew larger. Addie looked up from her work then, sensing the shift in the air. Her face pinched in confusion. She had seen the men in pristine, pale clothing walking in the streets every once in a great while, but never had any of them spoken to her, nor had she ever seen a silver coin before. I only trade for three coppers, she said nervously. The crowd tittered as the city official flashed a toothy smile. Hattie's cheeks flushed, her stomach flipped. She felt suddenly self-conscious. Everyone was looking at her. I see. This is worth 200 coppers. If you draw what I ask for, you are welcome to keep the extra. He kept the smile plastered on his face as his assistant withdrew a smaller tablet and held it in front of her, capturing the interaction on video. Addie looked to Mrs. Martinez for confirmation of the sum, who gave her a tight nod. Okay, what would you like me to draw? Have you ever seen the city from a distance away, where all the buildings can be seen together, reaching into the sky? Addie shook her head as her eyes pricked with tears. She didn't understand what the man wanted, and everyone was still staring. All she knew how to draw was what she saw, and she had no idea how to draw what he wanted. Let me show you. The city official swiped his fingers around his tablet and flipped it around for her to see the photo of the city skyline. Hattie stared at the picture for 30 seconds, taking in the shapes and details of the buildings that stacked on top of one another, clawing for purchase, trying to escape the rising sea beneath them. Okay, she said, once she had memorized all she needed to. She spread a clean sheet of paper on the concrete and began to draw, now oblivious to the swell of people around her. Addie grabbed colored pencils, seemingly at random, as the buzz from the crowd fell into the background. She used her whole arm to draw wide swaths of color, painting the sky in a frenzied rainbow, then placed the buildings against it, exactly as she had seen in the photo. When she was done, she stood and placed her hands on her hips, scrutinizing her work. Satisfied, she handed the drawing to the city official as his assistant took a photo of the exchange. Everyone clapped politely. The city official handed the silver coin to Addie, who thought it felt very heavy, and left with his drawing. The crowd dispersed, and Addie and Mrs. Martinez bought a hearty dinner to bring home, as well as a sealed box of brand new, colored pencils, which Addie clutched tightly to her chest. The video, artfully edited by the official's press team, went viral the next day. The drawing was posted to the city official's website with the tagline, A Vision of What the Independent City of New York Could Be. Cloud District citizens, as well as upper mids, loved it. The comments poured into all social channels, hashtags trended, and approval ratings went up, up, up. Addie was unaware that anything had changed. The next day, she and Mrs. Martinez returned to their street corner and went about their business as usual. They did not know that the city official was very astute and knew just how to keep the buzz going. He made some calls and secured for Addie Bell a scholarship to a prestigious STEAM academy where science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics students studied to become the next generation of city leaders. 
More men wearing cloud white uniforms appeared that afternoon, stepping out of a black car. Addie felt her stomach twist into knots as they approached. Mrs. Martinez stepped in front of her, blocking her from their view. It took some convincing for Mrs. Martinez to move aside and let them talk to the young girl. They asked where her father was, and when she told them, one of the men scrunched up his nose like he'd gotten too close to the deep's standing water. With Addie leading them, they descended rickety stairs to the banks of the deep. Her father stood, arms crossed and shabby clothes hanging from his thin frame, as the official's men showed him a piece of paper with a shiny seal. They spoke of moving, of government allowances, of giving Addie opportunity. Addie's father stood as still as stone, distrustful. He believed it was all a sham until they showed him the viral video and asked Addie herself, wouldn't you like to go to school, to take some art classes? Addie's eyes grew wide. She nodded, unable to speak. Mrs. Martinez often spoke of school. It sounded like a wonderful place. Seeing Addie's face, her father finally set down his collection bucket, grabbed his daughter's hand, and followed the men. Mrs. Martinez and their neighbors watched them go, with smiles that did not quite reach their eyes. Another video aired on the city broadcast. It was a compilation of quick cuts set against an uplifting song, showing Addie accepting her scholarship, moving into a house on the outskirts of the Cloud District with her father, and walking past the gates of the STEAM Academy. Her life, compressed into a 40-second press piece, could not convey the unbridled joy she felt as she stepped into her first art class, how her heart fluttered against her ribs, how her fingers itched to draw. In the academy, students sat in a ring, their heads bowed like acolytes before their easels. Each flicked their eyes towards the center of their circle, observing a bowl of fresh fruit set before them. A white-robed instructor sat Addie before an easel and told her to draw. The next two hours flew by in a blur of color and shape. Addie had never known such peace, to sit and draw undisturbed, listening to gentle music. At the end of the class, the work was critiqued. Addie listened as students commented on one another's shading techniques, use of color, or perspective. Addie's drawing was last. It left the class speechless. She did not simply draw the fruit and the table on which it sat like everyone else. She drew her view of the whole room, including the instructor as he paced between easels, the students at worship before their own art, the sweeping pillars that held the ceiling aloft, in her signature display of churning color. Addie twisted her hands, nervous at their silence. Tears stung the corners of her eyes as her fear and shame grew. Her art did not look like everyone else's. It is extraordinary, the instructor finally declared, and students began hounding Addie with questions. They clapped her on the back, praised her composition, and marveled at her color palette. Addie smiled so wide that her cheeks began to hurt and felt as if her chest could burst from happiness. After that, people began to call Addie Bell singularly talented, visionary, and genius. A month went by, then two, and Addie settled into her new life. She and her father took to spending their weekends in the park, taking picnics of fresh fruit and bread. Addie liked to draw her father sitting in the grass, running his hands through it, marveling at its softness, head tipped to welcome the sun on his skin. In the deep, he'd always been hunched, plagued with coughing spasms. A visit to the doctor had finally cleared the ailment in his chest, and he now breathed much more easily. While Addie went to school, he got a job in the mids sorting scrap metal in a factory. It wasn't glamorous work, but he made a decent wage and was home in the early evening to share supper with his daughter and listen to her talk excitedly about her day. As she grew up, Addie became the most celebrated artist in her school. Requests for her artwork poured into the academy from Cloud District citizens, for everyone with taste wanted a Bell original for their homes. Her instructors encouraged her to examine the world around her, noting the line, shape, and shadow of her environment. Addie drew and painted, observing her subjects closely. And the more she saw, the angrier she became. It started with small things, trivial points of friction with her classmates. The other students who grew up in the sun and sky knew nothing of the damp that swallowed those who lived below them in the deep. 
They teased her for being an outsider, then grew jealous when she stole all the attention of her art teachers. She did find friends and enjoyed spending time with them, but they could never understand where she had come from. When she tried to tell them what it was like growing up in the deep, she was met with uncomfortable silence. Such things were not talked about. The news did not even mention anything happening south of the mids. Well, you live here now, they would say, and the conversation quickly moved onto shopping and crushes. Her father did not like to linger on the past either. Addie could not bear the pain in his eyes when she tried to bring it up. So the picture in her mind of the deep grew faded and fuzzy, time softening the harshness of her memory. But she always thought fondly of Mrs. Martinez and wondered how she was doing. It did not seem right to bury the past so easily, so she kept the dulled shards of her memories, the jabs from her classmates, their lack of understanding, pressed tight against her ribs where they pricked her heart when she lay in bed trying to find sleep. On the day of her 16th birthday, the dulled shards of her pain were sharpened to razor points when she saw the news. The broadcast played on the screen in her room as she dressed for school. There was no way to change the channel. The broadcast came at scheduled intervals, morning and night, regardless of if they were wanted or not. The reports reminded them all how lucky they were and the dangers of what happened when one strayed too far from the confines of the Cloud District. This morning, the broadcast was a tale of the latter, a report on a crackdown of panhandling in the lower mids, an effort for citywide improvement. Addie watched in disbelief, hairbrush halfway through her tresses as Mrs. Martinez flashed across the screen. She and a few other faces she recognized were moved off their street corner by cloud guards. The old woman's hair was streaked with silver, the lines of her face deep with dismay. Her back hunched, but there was no mistaking her. Time had not been as kind to her as it had to Addie. With trembling hands, Addie tied her hair into its neat twist. She hugged her father goodbye, slung her bag over her shoulder, and marched to school. Her thoughts were in tangles. At the beautiful gates where she had nearly wept with joy upon first seeing them, she felt her cheeks flush and acid creep up her throat. Her feet were cemented to the sidewalk. The sight of Mrs. Martinez's face had rattled something deep within her, and Addie could not make herself go inside. Instead, she turned on her heel and began the very long walk out of the clouds. Addie strode past the towering, gilded homes to the first flight of stairs made of cement and iron. Down she went, minutes turning to hours, descending to the mids. The smell of standing water filtered up from the deep, even here. It stung her nose and sharpened those memories that had gone as soft and blurry as blended pastels. Her shoes were dirty and stained by the time she reached the corner where she'd spent her days drawing on the rough concrete. Mrs. Martinez was nowhere to be found. There were very few people around, and the street was oddly quiet, given that it was midday. Addie hadn't really expected her to be here. She took a long breath through her nose, adjusted her school bag, and took the rickety stairs back down to the deep, ignoring the strange looks from passersby. The shack was smaller than she remembered. Addie rapped on the rough wooden door with her knuckles, and a faint voice called through it. Who's there? Addie spoke past the lump in her throat. It's Addie, Mrs. Martinez. Addie Bell. The door opened a crack. Only Mrs. Martinez's wide eyes were visible. Oh, Miha, it's really you. Come in quick. Addie stepped inside the shack and took the offered seat on a three-legged stool. Mrs. Martinez sat on her bed with a groan. Miha, what are you doing here? Don't you have school? A smart girl like you shouldn't be missing your classes. I came to see how you were doing. Addie decided not to tell her that the reason for her visit was because she had seen her on the broadcast and that she wanted to relieve herself of the invisible guilt that she carried with her. She had thought that seeing Mrs. Martinez would make her feel better. It only made her chest ache. Mrs. Martinez's eyes darted to the door. That's very sweet, but I think you should go back home. She inhaled a wet, raspy breath and coughed her body shaking under the attack. Addie stood, alarmed. She sounded worse than her father ever had. You should see a doctor, she said, once the coughing had subsided. No doctor will see me, Mrs. Martinez croaked. Why not? 
I don't have insurance. Addie narrowed her eyes. What's insurance? You're sick. Papa saw a doctor and... Addie stopped at the sad look that passed across her former caretaker's face. Her cheeks burned, mortified. Of course, her father had only seen a doctor when they moved into their cloud house. I'm sorry, she said softly. It's okay. I'm glad you came to see me. I've missed you, but you really should be in school. Addie stood and gathered her bag. You're right. I'm happy I got to see you. Bye, Mrs. Martinez. She gave the old woman a careful hug and left. Instead of heading towards the shaky stairway, she walked along the damp, grimy streets of the deep, stopping when she reached the sickly lapping of the water's edge. Had it always been this far up the street? She stood, gazing out past the gloom of the rusty beams that held the city aloft. The water sloshed in and out, reeking up sewage and decay. A dead seagull, wings akimbo, floated nearby. Whispers of dissent had been bubbling up from the deep for some time. She had overheard her classmates, the children of government officials, share stories in hushed voices. They spoke of strikes, protests, retaliation. The ember of anger that had ignited in her chest this morning turned into a roaring flame. The sea was eroding homes, eating away at their crumbling foundations, yet the mids did not welcome the people who lived in the deep into their level of the city. Addie could not imagine the clouds ever doing anything to help. She looked at her shoes, stained from her trek. Shame made her eyes prick with tears. She'd been so blind, dazzled by the sparkling life she'd been given. Why had she been chosen, out of all the people here, to move up to the clouds? Addie felt suddenly that she did not deserve it. That night, at home as she lay in bed, unable to sleep, she searched for her own name on her tablet. She found a video that had aired after her first art class. A reporter had taken a short clip of Addie with her still-life drawing, the one she'd been so proud of on her first day. When asked about the nature of her composition, she replied that she'd drawn what she saw. She scrolled and found the video from the city official, the one with the tagline, a vision of what New York could be. Addie pushed herself out of bed and hastily cleared her work table. She grabbed her colored pencils and began to draw a copy of her own artwork. She drew it nearly identical to the original, with swirling colors and the city skyline. Only this time, she added a slashing line of blue, the ocean rising to swallow the city, bodies floating in the water. She scrawled a vision of what New York will be across it in jarring red. By the time she was done, the sun was just beginning to rise. Addie readied herself for school, ignoring the broadcast that played yet another cautionary tale. She placed her newest piece into her portfolio, tucking it safely between other drawings. Addie hugged her father a little tighter than usual as she said goodbye. While everyone else was in their classes, Addie stole away to the workroom. She made dozens of copies of her newest piece, printing bundles of flyers, which she shoved into her bag. Lastly, she made a large banner, wider than her arms, and half as tall as she was. Perspiration beaded on her brow as the laser printer did its work, rolling out her print one inch at a time. It finished just as her morning classes were dismissed. Her heart pounded in her ears as she rolled up the giant banner and marched back out the school gates. She walked, head held high, straight to the heart of the cloud district. At every corner, she tossed a few flyers from her bag, marring the pristine streets. She moved quickly, not stopping to hear the shocked murmurs at her behavior or the fearful whispers of rebellion. A little drone began to follow her once she was three blocks away from her destination. She broke into a run, anxiety making her swift. On the steps of the Capitol, Addie dropped her school bag and rolled out her banner. The drone had caught up with her and was now beeping shrill commands. Heavy footsteps sounded on the marble steps, but Addie did not look up from her work. She pushed the paper until it unfurled across the stairs. She stood, hands on her hips, studying her work. She could not hear the shouts above the sound of her own pounding heart, but she felt hands grab her roughly at the elbows. She was steered into a car that hovered off the street by cloud guards, their faces obscured by helmets. 
Addie did not feel scared until they escorted her to a windowless white room that smelled of antiseptic. Her stomach clenched in fear as they pinched her arm with a needle that put her to sleep and set about dissecting what had given this girl from the deep the audacity to paint the world in such colors. Addie Bell's Fall from Grace was a brief news headline on the evening broadcast. Too many people had seen the flyers for the incident not to be addressed. It made for a wonderful cautionary tale. Clouds sneered at their screens and removed their Bell originals from their walls in shame. For the little girl from the deep had no real talent at all. It was, in fact, a horrible anomaly of her vision that distorted her way of viewing the world. For Addie Bell was colorblind and did not perceive the world as those with all their proper icons did. She had been picking colors blindly, scribbling nonsense onto her canvases. There was no real vision there at all. And her vulgar art did not paint the whole picture, the effort the city was making to stem the rising seas, to help clean up the streets of the lower districts. The clouds washed their hands of her and went about their lives. Addie was questioned. The government wanted to know whom she was working with, who had given her orders to destroy her own art. Her answers were simple and honest. After a few hours of questioning, when they had given up trying to extract names of other dissenters from her, they left her alone in a cell. Her father watched the nighttime broadcast in stunned disbelief. He couldn't believe that his sweet, gentle daughter had done something so rash. He pressed his gnarled fingers to his mouth as images of her face flashed across the screen. He had no idea the rage she had carried inside her. His own anger had burned down to ashes long ago. He shrugged back into his jacket and walked under the golden glow of street lamps to City Hall. No one could tell him where his daughter was. There was no record of her or where she had gone. He was turned away politely the first three times. On the fourth day, armed guards escorted him down the pristine marble steps where Addie had unfurled her banner, forbidding him from asking again. In a last effort, he traced back down to the deep, as Addie had done a week prior. He knocked on Mrs. Martinez's splintered door and was welcomed in. She gasped wetly for breath. Her skin had the telltale gray tinge of lung sickness. When he told her of what had happened to Addie, fat cheers slid down her cheeks. But you should be proud, she said as she dried her face. She's a very brave girl. He wanted to feel pride. Instead, he felt hollow. He thanked Mrs. Martinez for her time and began his long trek home, heart aching. Addie had given him something he could not give her in return, safety and a place among the clouds. After the first few weeks, Addie lost track of how long she'd spent in the prison. She wondered if it had done any good, spreading her message through the streets. She hoped her father could forgive her, even if he never understood why she'd done it. Over time, her face paled, regaining the ghostly pallor of her girlhood. Her days dragged on in monotony, devoid of sun, art, and companionship. Sometimes, Addie found her fingers curling delicately, as if embracing one of her pencils, the habit hard to shake. At night, she fell asleep with a soft smile upon her lips and dreamed of a sky stained with a kaleidoscope of color. That was Visions for the Independent City of New York by Sydney Mays. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to us on. Or better yet, share the magazine and podcast with a friend. If you'd like to listen to more speculative fiction, visit us online at magazine.metaphoricist.com or on Twitter at metaphoricistmag.com.